Richard, by the way, great job. I just uh, really appreciate Richard. Uh, when Richard and I, I had the privilege of sitting down with Richard several years ago, and uh, it was exciting to me to find somebody that can bring some credibility to the organic uh, industry. Uh, I can remember back in 1980 when I was first exposed to it. I started farming in 1981 uh, with organic, uh, organic system. Uh, back then, it was a little different than it is today. Uh, it was an interesting time. It was an exciting time. I was a farm uh, farmhand, uh, worked on a farm, a hired man, and uh, the guy that I worked for decided to get out of farming and uh, hang it up because the farm went under bank management that he farmed. And so uh, I bought his machinery out and, and started farming. So basically, I was a hired man without a boss. And that's how I got started, with very little business sense, but I knew how to do the operations on the farm. And so that's at the time that I got exposed to organic farming, but we didn't call it organic farming. We called it the biohumic agriculture production system. And what happened to me was, because I was an orphan, the soil became my boss. It became my master. And I lived to serve the soil. And so I had dramatic success in my estimation. I was always amazed at how fabulous that soil was. And since then, I've never lost my desire or my, my thrill of farming or my thrill of working with the soil. Uh, in 1991, my life took a turn because my landlady passed away unexpectedly, so no longer was I farming organically. But I farmed from 1981 to 1991 as, a, as an organic farmer, but it wasn't certified because there was no such thing back then. But anyhow, today I'm going to talk on a perspective, of far, a farm manager's perspective. And a lot of that's the same perspective that you all have. Because a, a regular farm manager with conventional farm management, they deal with a lot of numbers. And that's their game. More I envision them sitting behind a desk. Uh, with me, it's more operations out on the farm. So the farms that I work with, uh, the word manage, uh, I, for, for me it doesn't feel comfortable, it doesn't fit real well, but that's what they call me. Because I'm hands-on, I'm operations. With an organic farm to make it work properly, uh, the operator becomes very, very important. The tools become very important, and the success of that far farm will hinge on that person developing the skills that are needed to be successful with that farm operation. So I'll advance my slide here if I can get this thing to work. I guess I can point this anywhere, can I, Mallory? Uh, anyhow, when I started back 37 years ago, there was a very strict process that was followed. And I see with a lot of farms today, they're still stuck in the conventional agriculture's mindset. Test the soil, find the symptoms, treat the symptoms. Okay? And your soil is still star starving, still naked, still going downhill. We've got soils in the area of Mason County where I'm from. I drive by the fields every day that there's, there's uh, gullies in those fields that you can stand in, and some of them you can hardly look out of, and some of them been no-tilled. If you're not putting back more than you're taking, you're depleting the soil. And so I think that's the thing I keep pushing on people to get them to understand it is so vital to put back more than we take. I, I categorize farmers in two ways. There's takers and there's givers. And that covers the whole spectrum. And uh, so the first thing I did back then, it made it real easy for me to remember because all four steps are promote life. And this was long before the regs were put together for organic. But the first thing back then is we didn't want to do anything to harm the soil whatsoever. I don't believe in being a minimum organic farmer. I want to be a maximum organic farmer. And uh, the second one, promote, promote life in the soil by inoculating soil with beneficial bacteria. And we did that. And it worked extremely well. We saw a dramatic change in the soil. Number three, promote life in the soil by using crop rotation to feed the bacteria and microbial life. This one is huge. The first thing I try to do is get people on that program and few stay on it. Because they'll talk to a farmer that's organic, that largely their farm is weeds, but that's accepted today as being okay. Where I came from and where I was taught was by the old-fashioned, old-time farmers that they had the kids working on the farm, they had livestock in the rotation, they had a closed-loop system, they had a beautiful farm, hardly a weed on the farm. The soybeans are a beautiful picture. The corn was beautiful. 
And it wasn't like we're seeing today as we get away from the true uh, spirit of the organic system and we get into more of the letter of the law part of it that we're going to do just as little as possible so we can get that USDA stamp. And so I see a lot of times soil conditions going south even when you're organic. I see people that are part of the club that are in the no-till cover crop club. Towery is the guy's name. They're conventional. They still use uh, a glyphosate to burn down the crop. They're building soil, in my opinion, faster than a lot of organic people that are farming. Organic doesn't automatically mean you're good, for your, you're good to your soil. And I think these are things that we need to personally really take a good look at in the future. Um, the last thing is promote life in the soil by using shallow tillage and to create a healthy environment for the aerobic soil bacteria and microbial life. See, all four steps are, are accomplishing one purpose, and that's to promote life in the soil. We all come from the soil, and uh, the soil is pretty important. Uh, when the soil bacteria starts to become diminished, all the little critters that feed on the soil bacteria become diminished. Then the earthworms become diminished. And then all the things that the birds and the field mice that eat the earthworms, they become diminished. And pretty soon, you won't believe this, that there's fewer farmers. They don't farm in 80 or 160 or 320. Pretty soon they're farming thousands of acres. And pretty soon the small towns disappear. We've all watched this, haven't we? It started with the smallest form of life in that soil. And until we get that back, we're not going to improve the economy. We can print all the money we want, it won't improve. We have to get back to feeding the soil. It's starving, it's naked, it's running a temperature, and a soil test and treating a soil test and treating the symptoms will not solve that. Okay, but it's very difficult when we have a society that's money driven in a capitalistic society, we're all after the almighty dollar. Well, one thing I've learned is less is more in organic or biological agriculture, and more is less. You can't have an, a, a rotation where your yields go down every year and your weed pressure goes up. Most of us don't have the skill or the talent to control our weeds in a soil that's starving to death. Okay, so job one to me is to start building back the soil with these four steps. Um, and start the, the environment for the biology. And here's my four-year rotation that I used religiously back when I started in the 80s. I still promote this rotation today. There's variations of rotations that will work. I use a nitrogen fixer before a nitrogen user and flop back and forth through the whole process of the four-year rotation. No-till is getting to be a big deal today, and everybody's pushing for no-till. I've been doing no-till since 1980. Because if you look at that rotation and you sit down with a piece of paper and list the months, 42 months out of 48, the ground's covered and it's being fed. Okay? I would like to make that 45 months out of 48. The year that my crop is in, 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 this, in the soil builder, the clover and alfalfa, it goes a full two years and that's to feed the biology in the soil. No hay's taken off. If I've got, if I, back when I had livestock, I'd take one cutting and the rest of the hay would be pastured, but I'd just take the one cutting and the manure would go back out on the field. Your soil's not going to get better until we make it better, and it doesn't get better by taking. Okay? And so that was one of the big things about my rotation. I'll go through it here. You can start with any one of the numbers. I start with soybeans because I've been putting on presentations where people are wanting to know how to transition land. And most of the time we're bringing it out of corn when it's been conventional because corn is the big crop. It's, it's planted over most of the acres. And uh, then I'm going to go to small grains. And with the small ga grains, it could be wheat, oats, barley, etc. cetera, uh, interseed, alfalfa, clovers, and grasses. And I'll have some slides later on that. But uh, uh, I want a mix of a deep-rooted plant to work with the soil deep and do the subsoiling to bring minerals up from deep. That's the alfalfa. I want an intermediate-rooted crop to take care of the intermediate tillage practices in the soil because I'm going to till that soil and build that soil with plants. I'm going to use the grasses as a shallow-rooted plants. In nature, broad leaves, annuals, are the first to build. They're the first on the scene to reclaim land. And so I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to try not to go against uh, the basic plan of, of, uh, of the creator and what he, his plan was. Okay, and the legume mix, I'm going to leave that a full year. So actually, if I, if I seed it, let's say I seeded it 
uh, this spring, it would go through that spring and then it would go around to that spring again, a full two years, and no hay taken off. Now, let me define that a little bit more when I say no hay taking off. If you bought a hundred head of 400 pound calves and you were gonna feed them out and you put them in the, in the, in the feed lot and you didn't feed them, what would happen? The same thing that happens to your soil if you don't feed it, okay? But we can look past that because we can take a soil test and put a little white powder on to stimulate it and get another crop out of it and think that we're getting somewhere. We've watched what has happened through how many years that we've been using soil tests and our soil has gotten poor. And I'll tell you a little secret if you promise not to tell anyone. In all the ar archaeological digs, they have yet to find a fertilizer applicator. <laughs> we didn't build this soil. As high and mighty as we think we are, we didn't build it. The infinite creator's natural processes build it. And we have to learn to submit to those processes and work with them in order to get the soil to become better. A soil test may show that it's better, but that soil test is a partial truth. And we all know what a partial truth is. We need to deal with truth and wisdom and get away from so much knowledge and facts. Facts, with enough money, you can prove anything. Okay. And then my last on the rotation would be corn. And I intercede uh, cereal rye uh, is what I promote and what I try to get guys to do. Uh, for a cover crop and also a green manure crop to be tilled in or rolled rye uh, with no-till guys. Okay, this here is a picture I threw in here because tools and talent are vital in organic farming. And many farmers today, they're as good as they think they are, but they don't realize how good they could be if they knew how good they could be. Okay. Our tools today, no cultivators out here, are designed to clean your field of weeds. Unless you go back and get an old one that's been in the fence row for a while. Okay. All these big fancy phones, it's like, it's like doing brain surgery with an axe. Okay. You may love your axe, it may have nice new paint on it, it may be the latest and the greatest, but I'd rather somebody use a scalpel on me or laser surgery if they're going to operate on my brain take a tumor out. Those weeds are in your field, they're growing with the crop, and we have to have a machine that'll take the weed out and leave the crop. And that takes talent. How many of you could take a four-wheel wagon? You remember the old 100 bushel wagons? How many of them could hook them on the front of the tractor on a hitch and back them for 25 miles with that jackknife and turn them around and, and drive them back to your farmstead and, and bar park it in the shed and never have to back up and straighten out? How many? I'll bet there was farmers 50, 60, 70 years ago could do that. Can we do it today? So see, we've lost something there we need to work on. I feel, that's my opinion. Because if you go to the field to cultivate and your cultivator sweep is more than three inches on each side from that row, you're grooming your weeds. You're not, you're not row crop cultivating, okay? And what you do, you actually make the weeds do better because they have all that loose dirt that nothing growing, they can put the roots out in and they can slap your soybeans and corn roots silly if they try to grow through there and get to some of that fertility. So having a row of weeds on each side of your corn row or your bean row can hinder your yield big time. And uh, that's why I promote the rotation so much and putting back and building our soil. Those weeds want to grow the soil. They want to build the soil. And we have to work with that process or the weeds are going to work against us. And those weeds can be so hot that you can't control them unless you're extremely talented. My specialty and my expertise is row crop cultivation. My dad was very good at it, and he didn't use herbicides for a lot of years after herbicides come around, so he carried that to me. But most people lost that. There's been several generations that have lost that process and the ability to do it. This is a beautiful field of cuckleburrs. The cuckleburrs actually are canoping over the top of the soybeans. And normally you look at that and you think there's no way you can clean that up with a row crop cultivator because physics are against you. But it's like flying an airplane. An airplane's heavier than air. But you, there are laws out there that will trump gravity. And that law is called Bernoulli's law. By the camber of the wing, it stretches the air molecules over the wing, causing a low pressure area, and the, the, the airplane is sucked into the air. And we know how much we can haul on airplanes because of that Bernoulli's law. Well, there's also a law here. Those 30-inch row soybeans are planted in a row. 
that gives them strength that the cuckaburs that are haphazardly planted do not have. Even though the cuckaburs have a stiffer shank and they have more stability by themselves than the beans do, they're not growing in a row. So you can clean them up with a cultivator. Okay, if you look, if you look real close, if I can get my pointer, those are soybeans. Okay? I set my sweeps in very close, and this is why I urge all of you to practice cultivating. What other industry would you want a neurosurgeon for the first time to operate that he's never operated before, he's never practiced anything, that he's going to operate on you? Would you like that? But yet we go to the field to do something that can make us tens of thousands of dollars and we've never practiced. Okay? So it is so vital to improve our skills if we're going to be successful and we're going to stay in the game. With prices where they're at now, you can make a lot of mistakes. Uh, that's why it's so important that we work on getting our rotation down so we can get our weeds where we can control them. You don't want something like this. Most people, you're looking at five to ten bushel acre beans. Even after they cultivate it, it's five to ten bushel acre beans. That's not sustainable. When you can turn a field to 45 bushel acre beans rather than five bushel acre beans, 40 bushels of beans times $25 a bushel, what is that? That's how much you pay yourself when you learn how to, to set your cultivators better. Okay, here's another picture. What would you do with that field? Okay, that's a field of grass with some bean rows out there. And uh, these, these are the situations that I work with and what my specialty is. When I go onto a farm, the objective is, is to increase the bottom line. And, of course, the most important part, I think, is to get a good rotation and a good practice going so that your weeds become less of a problem every year. Because even if you guys that are going to ro roll your rye and no-till, if your soil is hungry, running a temperature, you're going to have problems, in my opinion. I think if you have healthy soil, a lot of those practices are going to work like clockwork. They're where we need to head. They're in the future. Uh, so we need to really think about that. Here's this. I'm taking some quick shots here. Uh, this was done with a $200 cultivator. Everything I'm going to show you here. Uh, this cultivator was back in the day when they used cultivators to control weeds with. That was when the technology was at its best. And technology and real crop cultivation has went down since then. A lot of them are so you can sit on the tractor seat and eat your bomb bombs and play the radio and kick up your feet and have a good time. Problem is, it costs you maybe $1,700 an acre for not being able to get the weeds out of the crop if you have a high dollar crop out there, like some of the years we've had uh, certified organic white corn that sold for $17 a bushel. And if you can increase, increase that yield by 100 bushels of the acre, that's significant. And sometimes you can with simply cultivation. There's never been a better time to get in agriculture. Never could you buy a, a, a very low uh, cost line of equipment and still farm enough acres organically that you could support your habit. And that's exciting. I can remember when I started in 1980, I bought $100,000 of machinery. It was four row. Now you can buy $100,000 of machinery and it'd be eight row. And instead of 15 foot wide, you're, you're talking 25 foot wide equipment. So things have changed. It's gotten a lot better. And here's just more pictures. I'm going to flip through them pretty fast here. Uh, there's the $200 cultivator that I talked about. There's the field. There's just more pictures just advancing it as, as they got older and the season went by, and there they're harvested. A bean field that probably would have made five bushels of the acre with the wrong tool and an undeveloped talent turns into a 45 bushel of acre field. So you're, you're looking at in excess eight dollars $900 increase per acre just because you increase your talent. And being a farm manager and seeing different operations and seeing things happen, you cannot replace talent. And you cannot replace the right tool. Those are so vital. And here is an example that I wanted to use. This field here, very good soil. And this is why I ended up getting a chance to uh, work on this farm. I opened my big mouth and I shared with them, I said, you know, if you set your cultivator right, you can totally clean up that crop. You've got stage one grass here. The grass is spindlier than the corn. It's only about fourth the height of the corn. This field should have been totally, completely, and entirely cleaned. Okay? But the tool was not the right tool, and the talent had not been developed. And it was a custom farm situation, and there's no, and there's no skin in the game. All right? This field here has raised as high as 170 bushel acre corn since this. 
this corn made 30 bushel to the acre. When you're talking $17 a bushel corn and you're going to increase the yield by 100 bushel to the acre, what's that figure? My brain tells me it's $1,700 an acre. These are huge issues. It is huge. We're talking big money. It's something that makes you enjoy cultivating, which I have a passion for. Now, here's going to be a, a, a slide. Because sometimes I think I'm going crazy, uh, I went back and agreed to farm and transition 40 acres and, and make sure that the principles I'm teaching, that I don't just teach them, that I'm doing them and make sure that they're still working. And so I picked up 40 acres to transition, and this is T1 soybeans. And this is what I expect my crops to look like every year on every acre. It may not play the slide for me. Okay? That's a bummer. That's a, that's a field of beans. And uh, Anyway, it's a video. Do you know how to set that so it'll play? Okay. Do you have 2017 PowerPoint? Because I embedded the videos in here. Okay. But anyhow, why she's doing that, can you hear me all right? It's a beautiful field of soybeans, not one weed in the field. Okay, thank you. Not one weed in the field. That's what I expect. That's what I shoot for every year. Uh, then I had a picture next, was a picture of wheat, where it's a panoramic view where I took it with my phone and I went all the way around. Oh, you, you got something, Sean. Uh, you gave it back to me, didn't you? Yes, but it might play on. I think I, I think I put it back there in my thing. Let me go get it. It's in my case. Thank you, Jeff. I hope it's in here. Aha, it is. Technology, isn't it great? <laughs> Anyhow, my, my job, I feel, is to help people get their soil reproductive. Productive soils kill in agriculture, okay? Let me explain to you what I mean when I'm talking reproductive agriculture. If you have a dozen cows and you put them in with a bull, 11 of them breed back, one of them doesn't. That cow is considered infertile, am I correct? Stays an open cow. You take that cow to the university and they implant, implant and impregnate her with an embryo that's been fertilized, okay? She's still not reproductive, but if the numbers work out and you can sell that calf for enough money, she can be classified as productive. Are you right? Am I right, okay? When you take a soil test and it tells you you need to add a certain things to, to the soil, you're impregnating that soil, you're not making it fertile. A soil that's truly fertile will grow a crop this year and a crop next year and the biology will keep generating nutrients. Dr. Bill Becker came out to the farm that I farmed. He wanted to study what I was doing back in 19, the 1980s. And he says, Gary, you're gonna deplete your farm. It'll get so it won't raise anything. And he was at a field day at Jack Erisman's back in, I think, about 2012, 2013, before his death. And he shared that the best soil test he had ever taken and ever seen in his career was off the farm I had farmed. And I hadn't applied anything, nor did I even care if there was a soil test taken. Now, I know that, that flies in the, fla the face of our, 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 our modern-day conventional agriculture. But those earthworms are by far, you got her going? Good. Okay, thank you. Those earthworms are by far better soil chemists than anybody that's been to the university and been indoctrinated. Does that make any sense to you? We as people cannot re replicate what nature can. Nature's the best, and the, best we, the, the more we try to replicate what she does, the more successful we're gonna be. Here's the, soil, here's the uh, field here. This is T1 soybeans. They're a special food grade white hylum soybean. Not the best variety to grow for, on this soil for, the best, uh, for the, you know, the best yield, but it's what I chose to grow because I was planning on selling them at that time into a special market, but just sold them on the re regular market, okay? 
That's what I expect to see every year in every field. Organic should be far superior to the con conventional system, period. I will not accept wormy apples and weedy fields as organic, period. I saw too much. Here's the wheat. This follows the soybeans. I went back and redid and relived what I did back in the 80s, precisely. We used a biological inoculant. We put a humate on the soil to get the earthworms and the biology started in the soil. The biology does the rest. This is the catch crop. Well, yeah. That's not been clipped. That's what it looked like growing up after the wheat was cut. Most of the farms I see have a solid white sheet of foxtail in the fall after the frost gets, kills the foxtail, and you can't even see it's, it's anything but just foxtail. Why is that? I'm not a soil scientist. I'm just, I'm just obedient and submissive to the soil. The geniuses in the soil are the ones that know everything. I don't know much. But I know that by having the correct rotation and giving back to the soil, that the soil will heal itself. How am I doing on time? About 10 minutes? Okay. In this mix right here, I don't put in this mix what's good for Gary McDonald. I put in this mix what's good for the soil. It may be more work for me, but I don't really give a rip because it's not about me. See, I don't own the land. You don't own the land. The Constitution gives us the right to say we own it and hold up a sheet of paper and say, see, I've got the deed to it. But ultimately, we are owned by the soil, every cell in our body, okay? and we'll go back to it. So for us to have the audacity to think that we have the, 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 some legal right to rape it and, and, and take and take and take and deplete it and destroy it is, is an interesting concept. But in this field here, there are about 10 different species. There's Balanza clover. By the way, you can try this on, at your own risk, but they say not to use Balanza on organic production because Balanza will become a weed. I'm not worried about it. It won't be as bad as the cuckleburrs or the grass. Okay. There's also brome grass in this mix, and nobody puts brome grass in a mix, but I felt it was what the soil needed, and it would be the best for the soil. There's maybe some Timothy, I don't, I don't remember. I know there's orchard grass, and I sow the grasses with the wheat seed in the fall so they can get more time growing, more time feeding the soil the extra dates and doing all the great things the grasses do. Then the next spring, I come back and interseed the alfalfas and clovers. There's yellow blossom sweet clover. You don't want to put that in a wheat field. I do, but I'm not going to advise you to. I took the risk. I did it. Uh, there's also mammoth red clover. There's medium red clover. There's, a, there's an alfalfa in here. There's lespedeza, ladino possibly. I'm not sure what all I put in it. But my objective is, is to be really good to my soil and feed the soil. This here will stay on a four-year rotation a whole nother year. Now, I did clip this and leave it lay, and that mat on top of the ground will rapidly encourage earthworm population. Before I went out and did all this, I dig a hole a foot square and a foot deep and count my earthworms. That's a better soil test than a soil test. A soil test is not a soil test, really. It's a farmer test. The more you have to put on is evident of how poor job you're doing building your soil. Does that make any sense to anybody? Okay. I don't want to poo-poo on anybody's uh, parade here, but I want the farmer to go out and get his soil to eat right, exercise right, and do all those things that we, the, the patient, need to be doing to take care of our health. We let the doctor do the other stuff, okay? But that's my, my perspective on all of this. As a farm manager and watching this all unfold and seeing the many fields that are weeds and weeds and terrible weeds, and I, I, you know, back in the 80s, I didn't see that. The old-time farmers, uh, they didn't have that. Uh, but there wasn't the free-for-all to go after the last little bit either. And so we take and we take and we take. And uh, things get poorer and poorer and the weeds get worse and worse. And, and we don't have the skill to control them. Here's what a field looks like. That another part that I've rented that I'm going to um, uh, put in production. It's going to be a first-year transition. Next year will be soybeans again. And I will have a soybean field just like what you saw on this, okay? And I'm sticking my neck out saying that, but I've done this enough year, I'm pretty sure that's what I'll end up with. Now, 
farms and soils and how wet it is, how fast your soil draw, dries out, has a lot to do with how, how, how uh, confident you can be of your success. Uh, but this is a farm that I'll be able to get that accomplished. Now here we have cereal rye that I seeded two different directions, north and south and east and west. Three quarters of a bushel north and south only because I didn't have the drill set heavy enough and a, a bushel and a fourth going the other direction, crisscrossing. I'm doing what I can to perfect step one of roll rye and soybeans. I'm not going to go out there and have anything but success. Failure's not an option. So I'm gonna perfect that step before I try to go all the way and do the whole thing because I'm too much of a, an analytical uh, perfectionist nut um, to, to have a mess. I don't want that. Uh, it's stressful for me. But anyhow, uh, the next picture is a picture of uh, what I do at the bottom of a hole that's a foot by a foot by a foot deep. On that 73 acres, there was zero earthworms I dig one hole for every 10 acres, and if seven holes, there was either, thank you, there was zero earthworms, okay? Next, this spring, I'll dig a hole precisely the same time. On the first 40 that we looked at, there was 1.25 worms per hole. And the second year, there were not any more in population, but the worms were about three times the size. And the objective is to get the biology to grow. I can see the earthworms. I can't see the bacteria. Okay, I've got five minutes, so I'm going to... Keep moving forward here. Uh, here's what the bottom of that hole should look like. Okay? And it can take on a lot more water. There's, uh, the earthworms have eaten a hole through the soil. And uh, uh, that allows rainwater to go in. They also lace those holes with perfect fertility. They multiply the nitrogen anywhere from five to nine and a half times, depending on whose research you read. They multiply the phosphorus seven times and the potash 11 times. Scientists don't know how they do it, last I knew. Okay. They take the calcium or the pH, and if it's too high, they bring it down. If it's too low, they bring it up. Okay. And you know what? I have not received a bill yet. Okay. But these guys got to eat. Okay. And that's why I take one year rather than feed it to cattle and sustain cattle. I feed it to the soil. And a lot of people say, well, I'm building my soil. I got a rotation just like Gary, but they take four cutting of hay and then sell it off the farm. Okay. Big difference. Or they say, I've got cattle, so I'm building my soil. But yet you let the cattle eat down the organic matter, all the green growing stuff, all the way to the ground. That's like having 20 acres of solar panels to power uh, a community, and you turn your cows out on the solar panels, and they tromp them down and bust them up and, and poop on them and pee on them, and, and, and you don't get any power anymore. That's what happens to the soil. The soil has to have the exudates from the solar, solar process, the photosynthesis coming from the sunlight going into those plant leaves, and those exudates come out in the extra sugars and carbohydrates to feed the soil biology and create the aggregates. And that's not going to happen if we eat our pastures down to the very little bit. Okay? The cow's rumen will be fed, but the soil will starve, and we don't want that. Uh, there's several other things I was going to say. No-till. People think they're building their soil, and a good thing if they're no-tilling. If your soil's starving to death, it doesn't make any difference whether you strip-till, ridge-till, no-till, it won't make any difference. Build soil. And I'm a big proponent of the no-till concept. Don't, don't take me wrong by what I'm saying. But uh, anyway, with that, I don't know if you want me to open for questions or wait until afterwards. Is, are there any questions? What's your magic number on earthworms at this, at this point? Right there? Oh, uh, there's probably in sec in in SS excess of 40 in there. Now, Gabe Brown's had some. He says he's had 78 per cubic foot. I don't like him anymore. <laughs> he stole the show, and I don't, I don't have anything to do with him anymore. Yes, sir. I was taught that you wanted your deep-rooted, your intermediate-rooted, and your shallow-rooted. The species I pick is just from trial and error. Some farms, you can, you can plant eight pounds of alfalfa seed and four pounds of red clover, and the whole field will be red clover and very little alfalfa. You will find what mix will work with your soil and what will dominate and what won't. I want to get a good blend of as many species as possible. Because every species puts out a different exudate in the soil is what we've learned. This is the things I didn't know back when I started in the 80s. We've learned so much about, about livestock and grazing and about plants and what they do and how they communicate with the soil. So I don't know if that answered your question, but that's the, that's the best I can do. Yes, sir. 
about the 31st of March, around the last part of March. I try to do it the same every year. Well, thank you so much, Gary.